Okay, hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to continue our study uh, on Luke chapter 8. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do a short recap of what we have learned uh, last week um, in our class. Huh? Okay, so, so uh, there are actually seven sections altogether. Okay, but uh, last week we covered four sections. Uh, and uh, this week we're going to cover another three. But uh, this week, the three that we're covering uh, deals mainly with uh, miracles. Lah. Okay, so last week we saw who the women were with Jesus and we recognized that there were three very prominent women. I hope you remember what their names are. Then secondly, uh, you broke off uh, into individual work and you did the parable of the sower. Okay, so uh, after our class today, I will uh, give you the compilation of uh, the work that has been done lah, by all of you. Okay, but I've seen it and uh, it's a good job from everyone. Thirdly, we looked at the parable of the lamp on the lampstand. Okay, and then we realized that, you know, when we, sh when we receive God's word, we don't just keep it to ourselves. But the lesson behind this is that we should share it. Okay, because uh, whatever that we have received from God, okay, all the love and forgiveness, okay, it should be a light to others. Okay, so we should strive to be a blessing to others, uh, even as we continue to live our life uh, on this earth. Okay, and then of course, uh, we, end, we ended the session last week by talking about Jesus' mother and brothers. Uh, we didn't name them. Uh, actually, Luke doesn't name them, uh, okay, but Mark does. But the point of the, the, this event uh, is not to know, it's not just to know who Jesus' brothers were. Uh, okay, nor uh, nor was it uh, to talk about you know, the, the, the severity uh, of uh, Jesus' answer. Okay, like, he's, like he's, it's as if he was burning, like giving a slow burn to, to, his, uh, to his family. Uh. But more so, uh, we realize uh, that uh, we, we realize that Jesus, uh, uh, in identifying us, okay, those who follow his word and those who believe and follow his word, uh, in identifying the people um, who follow him, okay, as his family, uh, he is introducing something new that has not been uh, talked about before. You know, the concept of brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, uh, he, yeah, so, so we are, as I said last week, we are used to this because we always say, you know, we always sing about this, you know, and we always say it in church, you know, but to them, it was something very new. Okay, so we learned that, you know, dalam Yesus kita bersaudara, ah, begitu. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the last three events in chapter eight, lah. Okay, each of the three are uh, actually very big in itself. Uh, we won't be talking any more about Jairus' daughter, the miracle that happened with Jairus' daughter, because we covered it last two weeks ago. So today we're just going to focus on these three. Jesus comes a storm. Jesus heals a man with demons. Actually, there are two miracles that happen here, and then thirdly, Jesus heals a sick woman. Okay, so, so far in our study, we've always been focused on Capernaum. Okay, and we find that Capernaum has been uh, the place where Jesus goes to, uh, is at uh, the most. And he's taken a tour once in Luke chapter 4, and now he's taking the second tour. Lah. And part of his second tour, okay, around the Galilean area, is to travel across the Sea of Galilee, okay, which we are going to do now. Lah. Okay, so in this section, Jesus comes a storm. We're going to read from verse 22 to verse 25. Now, there are four verses over here. And let's, uh, let's open to our text okay, uh, and read the four verses. I'm going to ask the four guys. <laughs> okay, there are four guys uh, in, in our class now. Okay, and there are only three girls. So the four guys, uh, we're going to ask Eugene, Mordecai, Nigel, and Noel. Okay, one person, 22, 23, 24, 25. Two, three, four, five. Yeah, four verses. Okay, so one person, one verse. Uh, starting with Eugene. Uh. Go ahead, Eugene. Verse 22. Okay. Uh, one day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they shall they started out. Uh, Mordecai. As they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. 
Suddenly a strong wind blew down on the lake and the boat began to fill with water so that they were all in great danger. Um, Nigel, I think. Converse on again. The disciples went to Jesus and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we are about to die. Jesus got up and gave an order to the wind and to the stormy water. They quieted down. And there was a great calm. Okay, Noel. Is Noel here? Oh, Noel left already. Okay, sorry. Let me read this. Lah. Verse 25 uh, in the version I'm reading. Huh? Then he said to the disciples, Where is your faith? But they were amazed and afraid and said to one another, who is this man? He gives orders to the wind and the waves, and they obey him. Okay, so uh, it's a pretty simple story. Okay, Jesus got on a boat one day and then went across to the other side of the lake. Nah? So the lake that we are talking about uh, in this uh, in this event nah, is known as the lake of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Okay, uh, there are two other names. If you read the blue book, nah, okay, there's a note at the bottom there. There are two other names to this nah. One is called Lake Gennesaret and the other one is called Lake Garasa, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, if you have the blue book, uh, uh, please refer to that. If I made a mistake over there, please correct me. Uh. I think it's the Lake of uh, Lake Gennesaret and then the other one is uh, Lake Garasa. Sea of Garasa or Lake Garasa, one of those two. Lah. Okay, but either way, it is the same place. Lah. Okay, it is the same place. And we find that this place, uh, okay, on both sides of the, the, the this one, Okay, it is actually like uh, there are mountains lah. Okay, there are mountains, uh, there are mountains that are surrounding this area. Okay, and because there's some there are mountains over there, so you know it's going to be very windy over here because when the wind comes in through the mountains, okay, it's going to come in at very high speed. Okay, so uh, this sea of Galilee is actually very known for its uh, strong winds lah. So, uh, it is not uh, a strange occurrence per se. Okay, it's not something that, oh, this has ha never happened before. It usually happens that there are strong winds. Okay, but we find now uh, that in the text given to us, okay, uh, uh, when the strong wind blew down on the lake, the boat began to fill with water. And that was the very strange thing uh, that happened in this event. Lah. Okay, so uh, Jesus, Jesus, sorry, <coughs> Jesus was going uh, from Capernaum to the other side. Okay, it's, this place is called Gadara or Garasa, okay, uh, which we will uh, talk about uh, in the story of the man with the demons. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, my mistake. It's not called Lake Garasa, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, yeah, but definitely I know it's Lake Gennesaret. Okay, because when I studied this, I studied, I called it the Lake Gennesaret first, before it was changed to Sea in Galilee otherwise known as Sea of Tiberias. Okay, but uh, it is not a small lake, nah? not like the Tasik, like, you know, uh, Tasik Likas, you know, it's not that small. Nah? It's a huge piece of, it's a huge body of water, okay, that uh, you cannot actually see the other side of the lake, um, although it's called a lake, nah? but you actually cannot see the other side from the lake. If you're standing at Capernaum, nah? okay, if you're standing at Capernaum, you can't see on this side one. Nah? That's how big this lake is, lah. Okay. Some people call it sea, some people call it lake. But the sheer size of it, okay, the size of it tells us that you actually cannot see the other side. Okay, uh, You actually cannot see the other side of the lake, number one. And it also gives um, uh, some support uh, to why the, there is a strong wind that blows over at that side. Okay, Because the place is surrounded by mountains. Okay, And one of it is this mountain over here. Okay, So it's quite a windy uh, lake. Lah lake, sea, uh, whatever you want to call it. Okay, but interestingly enough, as they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. Okay, and uh, I think in the blue book, it also tells us that Jesus probably fell asleep, um, you know, because he had been doing ministry. Okay, he had been doing ministry, you know, we read the entire chapter 8, right? he not just taught in parables, uh, in chapter 6 and 7 or so, uh, as he was touring around Galilee, we find that he was also doing miracles. Okay, so I guess it's very natural for Jesus to fall asleep 
maybe because he was going to rest lah. Okay, but in his sleep, okay, when Jesus was fall, when Jesus when Jesus fell asleep, okay, we find that there's a suddenly a strong wind began to blow down on the lake. Okay, and the wind became so strong. Okay, the boat was the humbang humbing, and then after that, you find that water begins to fill the boat. Okay, and anyone who has ever ridden a boat before knows that this is a very dangerous thing. If water fills in the boat, okay, such that <laughs> okay, this is physics again, lah. Okay, if the water fills in the boat now, such that the boat's weight now becomes heavier than the 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 float the floating force, okay, or the upthrust uh, from the lake itself, uh, then you're going to you're going to be sinking. Okay, so I imagine now, uh, imagine yourself in the shoes of the disciples. Uh. Your teacher is sleeping, okay, but you are hard at work trying to make sure that everyone is uh, uh, trying to make sure that everyone stays alive. Uh, and you are probably busy, you know, scooping out the water with whatever possible way. Uh. Okay, uh, and if you watch enough movies, uh, you will know that sometimes a uh, strategy uh, to, you know, to keep yourself floating, uh, okay, is to throw out all the unnecessary things from the boat. Okay, heavy stuff. Uh, heavy stuff that you don't actually need. Okay, because uh, keeping your life is more important than keeping your possessions. Okay, so, you know, in all that chaos, uh, okay, and we find that Luke writes uh, that they were all in great danger. Okay, so it's not just like any other wind. It's like a super strong wind. Okay, that causes uh, the, the waves uh, to become very high. Okay, the waves become very high, overfill, overflow, spill into the boat, and makes the boat fill up with water. And that's very dangerous. Uh. So in the midst of this chaos, uh, okay, we find that disciples uh, go to Jesus. And what do they find when they go to Jesus? They find Jesus sleeping. Okay, so... You when we read uh, when we read this text, okay, and then and we see that the text says, Master, Master, we are about to die. Uh. Uh, I think I, I think I shared about this before. Uh, uh, I, I think I shared about this uh, in morning prayer before. Okay, that now uh, when Jesus when they went uh, to see Jesus, okay, the disciple I mean verse 24 tells us uh, okay, the disciples went to Jesus and woke him up saying. Master, Master, we are about to die. We should not uh, just imagine uh, like, like they are, it's, I don't think uh, that they went to Jesus uh, like they are scared of disturbing Jesus. You know, you know sometimes uh, how when people fall asleep, right? Then you like, Ayah, I don't really want to catch out them. So you, you just kind of like, you just kind of like poke and prod. Like, um, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jesus. I don't think they'll be doing that. Lah. Okay, they're not going to be like slowly, slowly, you know, shake Jesus slowly. I don't think so. Because it's already so chaotic at the time and they know that they're going to die you know, if they don't do something. Okay, they know that they're going to die. And and um, if I were a very hot-tempered disciple, I would probably be like, what is this Jesus doing? Okay, he's sleeping, you know. So uh, imagine this line, uh, you know, imagine this line that the disciples say. I don't know which disciple says it. And it is not pointed to us, okay? But now uh, this sentence, uh, "Master, Master, we are about to die," uh, okay, can be said uh, in two different ways, okay? It can be said in a very scared tone, scared as in you're afraid uh, because you're going to die, okay? So you know that kind of kachamasan that you feel, uh, or it can also, it may have also been said in a very angry voice, okay? We don't know for sure. Okay, we don't know for sure. I would suppose it's uh, scared because of what Jesus says after that. But there could be a possibility that they are also very angry. Okay, because like, you know, hello, here we are trying to save everyone's life and there you are sleeping. Like, you know, uh, don't you care that we're going to die? Like, okay, so I'm not sure. Okay, I don't know how the disciples uh, would have said it, but um, most likely, lah. Okay, most likely, and this is because of what Jesus says after this, uh, they were probably very afraid, and they had no time, uh, to go and slowly walk up to Jesus, uh, and then, uh, po how is, uh, sorry, uh, Jesus, we're disturbing you. No, uh, I don't think they got time to do that, lah. They probably ran to Jesus and shook him, you know, like wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Okay, hello, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, and they are probably very afraid. Okay, fear. 
uh, probably drove them to do this. Lah. Okay, no time uh, to be so respectful and this one. Like, ah, sorry, ah, sorry, ah. no, ah, no. Okay, and then Jesus got up. Okay, Jesus got up and he gave the order to the wind and to the stormy water and they quiet down and there was a great calm. Okay, um, I am not sure. Sorry, ah, hold on, ah. yeah. Okay, in Luke, lah, Luke tells us that Jesus got up and gave the order. Okay, I think another version tells us uh, that Jesus uh, got up and uh, he rebuked, yeah, rebuked the wind and the waves. Okay, rebuked too, macam menengking, okay, or marah, okay, not to say marah, lah, like, hoy, quiet, something like that. Lah. Okay, so, but the thing is, this, lah, after Jesus got up and gave the order, okay, and this is where the miracle happened, okay, the wind and the waves, okay, the wind and the stormy water, okay, quieted down. And there suddenly was a very big calm. It was such a big difference uh, from something that just happened two minutes ago. Two minutes ago, everyone was fighting for their life. You know, you know in the midst of the difficulties and the, and the, and the struggles that they're going through, uh, okay, everybody is fighting for their life and they forgot that Jesus is at the back there sleeping. Okay, and then when they finally remembered, they're like, Oi, Jesus is still sleeping. Okay, then you wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Okay, and then you know, after Jesus got out, he just gave the order, and then suddenly there was a very big calm. And Jesus asked his disciples a very important question. It is it seems uh, like four very simple words. Okay, but actually these four very important words. It's a very important question that we should not take very lightly. Jesus said to his disciples, uh, Where is your faith? Okay. And so that um, let, let, let's come back to this uh, in a while. Uh, okay? We will go on to disciples' response. Disciples were amazed and afraid, as always. Okay? They're always forever amazed and they're always forever afraid. Okay? And then they say to one another, Who is this man? Okay? He gives orders to the winds and the waves and they obey him. Now, the disciples' response uh, is a little bit funny. Uh, okay? And probably goes uh, in line uh, with why Jesus says this. Uh, where is your faith? Okay? Now the reason why uh, the reason why Jesus would say this uh, is because you know the disciples have been traveling with Jesus uh, for uh, quite some time now, okay since chapter since chapter four, okay and even in okay la, not all the disciples traveled from chapter four la, but let's assume uh, okay that they've been traveling with Jesus for a long time they have seen Jesus do a lot of miracles healing people you know recorded and unrecorded and they've also heard Jesus teaching. You know, and you think that you would think uh, that after some time, uh, they will be like, "Yeah, okay, I believe in Jesus. Okay, I, I believe in Je I believe that He can do this because I've seen it for myself." Okay, but it's still quite amazing uh, that they would still react so. Uh, they would still number one when the when the difficult situations came uh, Okay, when the wind and the water came as they were traveling on the sea. Uh, Okay, the first thing they did was to try to save themselves. Okay, they did everything that they can to save themselves. And only until they remembered uh, that Jesus is still sleeping somewhere in the boat that they went to go and see Jesus. Okay, and, and, and the reason why I said that, you know, the reason why I said now, uh, why did the disciples say, Master, Master, we are going to die? Uh, it is probably in a very scared tone. Okay, rather than angry. I like, could be angry, but I would think that it's uh, probably in a very scared tone. Because Jesus asked, where is your faith? You have seen me. Okay, you have seen me done all these miracles. You have seen me heal people that were very sick. Okay, you have seen me, you know, do a lot of things that are very impossible in this natural world. Okay, especially when it talks about healing people uh, you know, driving out demons, healing people. You have seen me do this. And yet, nah, you are still afraid. And yet, you still don't believe. You know, and Jesus asked this very important question. Where is your faith? You, know, you say you believe me. You, know, you say that you want to follow me. You believe me. And yet, nah, when something like a storm happens, nah, and you find yourself, you know, you are going to die. Nah, you know? You still what you what what is our natural response? No, our natural response is to try to solve the problem first, okay, and not seek Jesus uh, first. Okay, which is why 
Jesus res- Jesus responds to his disciples. Uh, he didn't say much, you know. I, I don't think he said much, lah. You know. I suppose that if Je- <laughs> if Jesus were like me, uh, sorry, if I were like Jesus, lah. You know, I would probably not stop uh, at where is your faith. I would probably go on to a very long lecture. Like, oh, no, 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 you should be like this, you should be like this, you should be like this. But Jesus asks uh, four very, Jesus just needs to say four very important things to remind the disciples again you know, that, hey, this is me. Okay, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. Okay, you believe in me. You have, and some more, you are the people that have seen me do this, you know. Okay, we've, uh, in, in the later part of uh, this gospel, and I think also in John, uh, Jesus, says, blessed are, uh, Jesus says to Thomas, uh, the doubter, one of his disciples, blessed are those who don't see but believe. Okay, they did not see Jesus. I mean, those, blessed are those who have not seen Jesus but actually believe in him. Okay, these are disciples that have seen Jesus, that have followed Jesus all the way, seen everything that he's done, and yet they still didn't have that faith. Okay, which is why Jesus asks, where is your faith? Okay, so this incident uh, shows us, number one, that Jesus has the authority over the forces of nature. It is a very clear example. Okay, that even the forces of nature cannot overcome Jesus. Okay, and because he has the authority over the forces of nature, something uh, that none of us have, we cannot control the rain, we cannot control the sun shining. Okay, if I had a choice, I would ask the sun to shine a little bit less so that it will not be so hot. Okay, and only somebody uh, who has the authority okay, over the forces of nature must be somebody who is God like, okay, somebody who is God. Okay, so this incident also shows us uh, that Jesus must be the Son of God. Okay, which is. Uh, which is this question that was answered. Like, who is this man? He gives orders to the winds and the waves and they obey him. Because the Jews know at the time okay, that nobody, I mean, this is very natural. None, nothing, no, none of the forces of nature listens to man. We cannot control the wind and the waves. Okay, but God can. Okay, God can and because he is God. Okay, so, a good question for us to think about this is this lah. You know, Jesus is always in control. You know, how will knowing that Jesus is Lord over all things uh, help you when you feel overwhelmed by your problems and difficulties? Okay, be assured that Jesus is with you and that He is always in control of all things in your life. Trust Him that He will always take care of you. Okay. Storms in our life uh, will always happen. And there is nobody uh, that can go through life uh, with no difficulty whatsoever. That's, that's living a lie. La. <laughs> okay, I think as long as we are on this earth, uh, we are bound to face some form of difficulty or another. And to every person, uh, the difficulty is different. Okay? Maybe some people, the difficulty is, you know, uh, it could be financial difficulty. It could be a health difficulty. It could, it could even be something... Uh, you know, it could be a family difficulty. It could even be a personal difficulty. Okay, but in the difficulties of our life, okay, let us remember lah, that Jesus is still in control. Okay, that He is still in the boat. Okay, and rather than be like the disciples trying to solve all our problems first on our own, and then only realizing that Jesus is in the boat, let us realize that Jesus is in the boat first. Before we, you know, before we take steps uh, to overcome our problem, and we call Jesus first. If anything, like, the lesson that the disciples would have taught us uh, is that we should have, the disciples should have called Jesus first. Okay, if we proclaim to believe that Jesus is in control and that we trust Jesus, we should call Jesus first in any problems that we face. Surrender it to Him, okay, and then, uh, and then we work from there. Okay, rather than the opposite way. Okay, so that's the first part uh, of uh, today's lesson. Uh, okay, which is the story about the wind and the waves traveling across over to, Ger- uh, sorry, to Gerasa. Okay, Sea of Tiberias, Sea of Galilee, and Lake Gennesaret. Okay, and now we come to the infamous story 
of what happened in Gerasa, okay, which is Jesus heals a man with demons. Uh. Now, there are two parts to this event. Lah. Okay, the first part deals with the man itself, and then the second part deals with uh, the demons. Okay, which well, we're going to read all this uh, from verse 26 to verse 39. Okay, so uh, just to recap, uh, okay, we find that Jesus and his disciples sailed all the way to Gerasa. Okay, and uh, now Jesus is here. Uh, Okay, in this region altogether. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, read all together. How many of us? There are seven of you here. I'm going to ask one person to read two verses each. Okay, one person, two verses each from verse 26 all the way to verse 39. Oh, sorry. Yeah, verse 26 to verse 39. Let me see here. Uh, 13 verses. Yeah, okay. One person, two verses. Um, do you want me to call your names or are we going to... Oh, okay, fine. So we'll skip Tristan. Lah. I think we won't even be able to come to you, Tristan, but it's okay. Wow, fake lah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start from Anna. Lah. Anna, can you start by reading two verses? Is it possible for you to read? Uh, okay, yeah. Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Gerasa, which is across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a man from the town who had demons in him. For a long time, this man had gone without clothes and would not stay at, the home, at home, but spent his time in the burial caves. All right, uh, Christina. When he saw Jesus, he gave a loud cry, threw himself down at his feet and shouted, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus had ordered the evil spirit to go out of him. Many times it had seized him, and even though he was kept a prisoner, his hands and feet tied with chains, he would break the chains and be chained, sorry, and be driven by the demon out into the desert. Thank you, Luigi. Okay, 26, 27, 28, 29. 30. Jesus asked him, Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Mob. He answered, because many demons had gone into him. The demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nigel, 32 and 33. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on a hillside. So the demon begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he let them. They went out of the man and into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. Uh, Mordecai. The men who had been taking care of the pigs So what happened. So they ran off and spread the news in the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine? Those who had seen it told the people how the man had been cured. Then all the people from the territory asked Jesus to go away because they were terribly afraid. So Jesus got into the boat and left. Okay, I'm going to read the last two. Huh? The man from whom the demons had gone out begged Jesus, let me go with you. But Jesus sent him away saying, go back home and tell what God has done for you. The man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. Now, essentially, uh, this is the, some people call this uh, the story of the first uh, non-Jew uh, convert, lah, or the first um, missionary or the first uh, evangelist nah, who was not a Jew. Okay, because uh, this is outside of Israel, it's on the other side now, nah, okay, it's called uh, Gerasa. Um, but actually, I'm not really sure myself. I've, I remember hearing about this before. Lah. Like, this man, 
okay, went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him, uh, was actually the first, uh, the first evangelist, uh, the first missionary to go and spread uh, the good news uh, to, uh, to the Gentiles, okay, the non-Jews. Uh. Okay, so we come back to our uh, PowerPoint once again. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to recap the story, okay, uh, we find that Jesus uh, is on the other side of Galilee, okay, going uh, into Gerasa. And we find that there are a couple, there are a few characters in this uh, particular event. Okay, first of all, there's this man who had these demons inside him. Okay, it's not just one demon, you know. Okay, we will come to that in a while. Lah. So that's the first character. Besides Jesus and his disciples, huh, a few characters, a few key people, key key characters huh, okay, that we need to talk about. First was this man who had the demons. Secondly was the, the bunch of demons okay, themselves. Thirdly were the pigs. <laughs> yeah, I know, even the pigs played a very important role in this uh, story. And the fourthly, fourthly were the people in Gerasa or Gadara itself. Okay, so there are four components uh, into this story besides Jesus and his disciples. Okay, so when Jesus stepped out uh, of the boat, okay, and he went to Gerasa, he was met by a man from the town who had demons in him. Okay, and we find that there are some things about this man that we need to know. Lah. First of all, that he was naked. Okay, he was, uh, he, for a long time, he had gone without any clothes. Okay, and he wasn't staying at home. He was staying in the burial caves. Okay, he was staying where people were buried. Okay, remember that in those days, uh, that people were not buried at graveyards. Uh, people were buried and then they were put into caves. Okay, just like uh, how later we will see, uh, just like how Jesus was buried. So, um, we find that this man uh, was, you know, spending his entire time, not at home, but he was spending his entire time in the burial caves. Okay, and um, because he was so strong, okay, uh, the people of that area, okay, and so strong and so uncontrollable, he probably he probably made people feel very uncomfortable. Okay, so the people in Garasa tried to tie him down. Okay, so he had all these chains around his hands and his feet. Okay, but because of the demons inside him, he had that superhuman strength, okay, to break them. Okay, so you know, if you were somebody from Garasa, you would probably be very afraid. Lah. Okay, because there's, there seems to be nothing, there seems to be no way to stop this man. You tie him with chains, so always pecah. Okay, uh, but the only good thing is that he was driven out by the demons out into the desert, which is probably where the burial caves were also there. Lah. Okay, so, you know, so when Jesus went to Gerasa, he was met. Uh, he was met by this man. Okay, he saw this man who had demons in him. Okay, and the man with the demons, what happened is when he saw him, he gave a loud cry. Okay, now we have seen this word, the loud cry before. Remember the first miracle in chapter 4. Okay, when uh, Jesus, well, yeah, Jesus healed a man with an evil spirit inside him. And the evil spirit in that man caused the man to cry. Ah, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Okay, so in the same way, this man with demons, when he saw Jesus, he also gave a very loud cry. Okay, and he threw himself down at Jesus' feet and shouted at Jesus, calling Jesus the thing that he's supposed to be called, which is son of the most high God. Okay, once again now, uh, we see that even the demons, uh, okay, even the demons are uh, recognized who Jesus was. Okay, and they call Jesus appropriately. Jesus was the son of the most high God. Okay, what do you want? What are you doing here? Okay, so, you know, and it's very obvious that, um, the demons not only knew who Jesus was, but they were also afraid of Jesus. Okay, and what Jesus had been doing uh, was Jesus ordered the evil spirit to go out of the man. Okay, and but the man begged him not to punish. Uh, the man, sorry, Jesus was then begged by the man not to punish him. Okay, and we find that Jesus asks, "What is your name?" Okay, and the the man said, "Sorry, uh, was it the man said?" Jesus asked, what is your name? My name is Mob. Yeah, he answered. And the reason, if you know what is the meaning of Mob, okay, yeah, we always have to use the word Mob in words like Flash Mob. Okay, uh, Mob is a huge group of people, uh, supposedly a huge group of people. Okay, if you read uh, the footnote uh, in your blue, in your blue color textbook, you'll find that some versions, 
uh, some versions uh, of this event uh, say that uh, translate the word mob uh, to mean legion. Okay, legion. Uh. And uh, a legion, uh, okay, a legion is a group of soldiers that is led by uh by by a head soldier but a legion is a group of soldiers that um if i'm not mistaken okay if i'm not mistaken um i think there are six thousand is it six thousand or three thousand um somebody who has a blue book uh just you know you can write down in the chat okay but this is an insane amount of demons Okay, in a legion, okay, it's an insane, it's a very big amount of soldiers, okay, that is controlled by the head soldier, legionnaire, I think must something like that. Okay, but uh, the reason why he said my name is Mob, because he had many demons inside him. This is a very suffering way to live, to live. It's probably also the reason why, you know, he had all this superhuman strength. Because it's not just one demon. If you have any experience, uh, or if you have if you have seen uh, okay, if you have seen people that were possessed by demons, uh, it's, uh, whether in real life or, or or in movies, okay, you will know that sometimes the demons uh, will cause the humans to do something that is very not very natural uh, to the person itself. Okay, uh, so much so that even this so-called superhuman strength uh, is also possible. Okay, something that the person would not normally do or would not have the strength to do it. Okay, but because of the demon inside him or her, uh, you know, suddenly you find that this person, wow, has this kind of strength. So imagine uh, if just one demon were to possess uh, a man, okay, and that would be possible. What about an entire mob of demons? Okay, many demons. Lah, okay, or in other words, a legion of demons. So it's a whole lot of demons to be inside one man. Okay, which is probably why the man, you know, was was driven crazy by it. Lah. Okay. And since Jesus was trying to, you know, trying to heal the man, okay, from this one, ordered the evil spirit to go out of the man, we find that the demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. Okay, and abyss, nah, I like to I want to share this thing that is uh that I saw over here in the text that I was reading. Nah. This one. Okay, it was thought uh, that the demons were to be imprisoned in the depths of the earth until their final punishment. Okay, the abyss, la, the abyss is an abyss la, is like a very deep place. La. Okay, a deep and it's and because it's deep, it's also very dark. Okay, like a place of no hope, you know, like a dungeon or like a like a very, very dark, dark basement. La. Okay, so when uh, Luke writes this, uh, the demon begged Jesus not to send him into abyss. I like this footnote that is given in this text over here. Lah. Okay, the demons begged Jesus not to send them uh, into the depths of the earth to be imprisoned. Okay, so um, I always wonder, lah, you know, sometimes when I read this, I always wonder why Jesus, why didn't Jesus do that? Lah? Why did Jesus, you know, send them into, why did Jesus do what he did after that? Lah? I mean, he's Jesus. He's just proven to us that he has control over nature. And he's proven time and time again that obviously he has power over demons. So why would he not, why would he actually lie on the permintaan of the demons? Lah? Is it, it's definitely, of, of course, lah, it's definitely not because he has less power than the demons. But uh, I always wonder lah, okay, why Jesus actually agreed to this. Okay. So the demons uh, begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss, okay, but to let them go into the herd of pigs uh, that were feeding on the hillside nearby. So, you know, there was this group of pigs that were nearby and the demons begged to be sent into the pigs uh, instead of living in the man. Because the thing that definitely Jesus wanted was not uh, for, for the demons to be out of the man. Okay, but the demons didn't want to just go out and then got no place, no place to be. La. Okay, so Jesus agreed and sent the demons out of the man and into the pigs. So whoosh. Okay, and interestingly enough, the whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. Okay, I want you to imagine this situation uh, if you were looking at this as an outsider. Okay, uh, imagine if you were one of these men. 
okay, or even this man like, who's holding down the, the, the man in, with the demons. Okay? Jesus, the demons through the man is telling Jesus, Jesus, don't send me into the abyss. Okay, send us into the pigs instead. Okay, we will leave this man, but you send us into the pigs. Okay? This is another interesting thing. Okay, that Jesus uh, had the power to control where the demons were supposed to go. Yet another proof, uh, okay, that Jesus is Lord of all. You know. Jesus, Jesus is showing once again uh, that he has power uh, over nature and even the demons. Even the demons uh, will have to obey Jesus. Where do you want, you know, where can we go? You know, Jesus, Jesus had the power to control where the demons uh, were supposed to go. Okay, so Jesus sent them into the pigs. Okay, so if you were this man, then suddenly you find that all the pigs are just jumping off the cliff one by one. And this is not just one or two pigs, you know. It is a whole herd of pigs. Okay, I'm not sure whether there were a legion of pigs, uh, which again, sorry, I don't remember whether it's 6,000 or 3,000. But you know, this is whole herd of pigs. And suddenly all of them, uh, the whole herd, you know, not just one pig or, you know, or two random pigs. Uh, it is the whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. I think if I were this man or the, or the pig caretaker uh, or the pig farmer, uh, okay, I would be probably very shocked. How come suddenly my pigs uh, are acting crazy and then they're just jumping off the cliff uh, and then died? Okay, I'll probably I will probably be also well, depending on what mind I had. Like, if, I guess if I were a businessman, I would probably be very like, oh no, okay, rugi sangam besar. Now we can't eat these pigs because they all died and drowned. Okay, and there's no way to salvage the pigs. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first miracle like, in this event. Uh, actually, the first and the second. Like, okay, the first is the healing of the man itself. The second one is sending over the demons are into the pigs. That's another miracle in itself to show us uh, that once again, okay, that Jesus has power over nature and the demons. Okay, and once again, uh, proving uh, okay to the people, okay to his disciples that were following, and also to the people in Gerasa uh, that he is the Son of God. Okay. But instead of looking at that, uh, instead of seeing it that way, let's see what the people from Garasa or the men taking care of the pigs, what did they do? So they saw what happened, okay, which is this. Wow, look at this interesting picture of the pigs <laughs> flying over the cliff. Okay, so the men taking care of the pigs saw what happened and then they went to report. Okay, they ran off into the town and farms to spread the news. Okay, and I'm really not sure whether they were happy, whether they were sharing it in a happy voice or not. But definitely the people that came, okay, they came out to see what happened. And this is the first thing they saw. They saw that the man uh, that they had been trying to control, okay, and was always naked before, is now clothed, number one. The man that was crazy uh, was now in his right mind. He was sane. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is something that has never happened before uh, to the man in their experience. Okay, if you remember looking back, uh, okay, this man uh, in was not clothed, no clothes. Uh, okay, he was no clothes. Okay, and number two, he was he would never be able to sit still. Okay, he was not able to sit still, and then number three, he was uncontrollable. Okay. You cannot control him. He will tie his hands with chains. He will break them. He sometimes will just run out into the desert. You know, just cannot control. Okay? But upon meeting Jesus, huh, look at the drastic change that happened to this man. When he was naked, okay, now he, is, now he has clothes. When he was crazy before, now he is in his right mind. Okay? When he was uncontrollable, cannot sit still at all, now he's sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Okay, so no wonder the people were afraid. Okay? No wonder the people were afraid because like, wow, this is the guy uh, we have been trying to control for so long. You know? We are failing. We cannot do this. And here comes Jesus uh, and suddenly this man who has a lot of demons in him uh, has no more demons in him anymore. Okay, so it's understandable uh, why they were afraid. 
Because number one, this is their first encounter with Jesus. They probably would have heard stories on the other side of the lake, but we don't know. Okay? This could be, this could have been their first encounter, their first experience uh, of what Jesus could do. Okay. So uh, I have read, sorry, told by those who have seen it, how the man. Okay, yeah. So, you know, their response, lah. Okay, all the people uh, asked Jesus to go away because they were terribly afraid. Uh. Okay, some I I read lah, uh, I read in you know different different places. Uh. Some people seem to think that number one, they were afraid because of the loss of the pigs. Okay, which is very natural. Okay, if they had been rearing pigs and if if their if their livelihood uh, was really based on the pigs, uh, okay, they were probably very afraid because they didn't want to lose any more money. Okay, it could be that. Okay, because actually they, uh, the Bible, uh, uh, Luke doesn't tell us uh, what they what were they actually afraid of. Uh. Okay, so we can only make an educated guess. Uh. Number one, it could be they were afraid because they didn't want to lose any more pigs. Okay, we, and we only know the whole herd, but we don't know how many herds there are. Uh. Okay, maybe they still had like, you know, backup pigs at home. Uh, I don't know. Okay, but they were afraid that they were going to lose their business. Another thing that they could possibly be afraid of is they had seen this drastic change uh, that happened in this once before this was a crazy man. Okay, and they were probably very afraid. They were wondering, who is this Jesus? Okay, and we find out uh, that every miracle that Jesus does, every, in almost every miracle that Jesus does, uh, there is going to be some people that are going to be afraid. In the previous miracle, we talked about when Jesus calmed the storm. Uh, Okay, also we saw you know, that people were afraid. Okay, people were afraid because they did not know who Jesus was. Okay, again, Jesus asking, where is your faith? You claim to know that, you claim to know me, but yet you don't believe in me. Okay, so, you know, um, we, what we know okay, is that they asked Jesus to go away because they were afraid. But what were they actually afraid of is something that uh, we don't really know for sure. It could be because of the loss of the pigs or it could be because of the man itself. The man that had many demons now had no demons and was totally sane and totally fine. Okay, he was not tearing his clothes and neither was he tearing any chains. Like he had no chains on him. Okay, so, uh, and, but the story doesn't stop there. Lah, okay, <laughs> thankfully the story doesn't stop there because the story stops there. Then, you know, this, is, this will probably be a very sad event. Okay, we find that when Jesus left Garasa, okay, the man begged Jesus to let him go with him. Okay, the man who was originally in Garasa wanted to follow Jesus back, okay, to Galilee. But Jesus said, no. Okay, go home, go back to wherever you came from, okay, and tell them what God has done for you. And this is what the man did. Okay, he essentially uh, became the first evangelist, became the first missionary. Be, became the first person to share the good news of Christ. Okay. At least this is what we can gather from Luke. Lah. There could be other people, but this is the first recorded person okay, that, that we know uh, that actually went to spread the good news you know, to other people. And this, you know, this teaches us uh, two things. Lah. Sometimes uh, when God does things for us, uh, you know, when God, uh, when God does a miracle, okay, we find out that man always has two different kinds of responses. Lah. Okay, some don't believe. Okay, some don't believe. When we share the good news of Christ lah, with other people, we find that some don't believe. Okay? And they would rather you, you no, know, it's okay, go away, go away. Okay, I mean, it's very obvious lah, that Jesus didn't mean them any harm. And I think that they could see that. Okay, that Jesus didn't mean them any harm. But yet now, uh, they choose to go away in Jesus. Okay, we don't want you here. Okay, that's one form of response uh, to Jesus, the good news of Jesus. The other response will be like the man who was healed. Okay, the man who was healed wanted to follow Jesus. Okay, but Jesus gave him a different order. He said, it's okay, go back to your place and tell them about what God has done for you. And that's what the man did. Okay, the man followed Jesus' instructions. <laughs> okay, the man followed Jesus' instructions. 
he essentially became the first person to share the good news of Christ. Okay, as recorded in the book of Luke. Okay, so that's the story of the man, uh, the man who had uh, many, many demons. Uh. Okay, and it's the only story that happens on the other side of um, Galilee, uh, Garasa, that we know of. Okay, all the rest of the events are happen in Galilee. Okay, all the way into chapter 8. Uh. <clears throat> Sorry, chapter 9. All the way into chapter 9. Okay, so one last part. Okay, one last part before uh, we finish is to talk about the healing of the sick woman. Okay, we have talked about Jairus' daughter, okay, which is uh, this event over here. So we're not, oh, sorry. So we're not going to, as I said, we're not going to spend time here because we did that already two classes ago. But we're going to talk about an event uh, that happened on the way, okay, on the way to Jairus', uh, Jairus's house. Okay, so let's uh, once again turn to our text and uh, read from verse 20, sorry, verse 40. Yeah? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you all to read from uh, verse, all the way, lah, okay, verse 40 until verse 48. Okay, we've done 49 to 55 and you can watch this video uh, in the previous lessons. But we're going to read from verse 40 to 48. Okay, and then... Uh, we will we will learn we will uh, explore the text from there lah. okay so let's have one person to read every verse oh I noticed Noel is with us so okay good so let's have one person to read every verse huh? starting let's start from the back lah. oh Tristan cannot go uh, okay let's start from Jasmine one verse one person 40 to 49 okay um when Jesus returned to the other side of the lake, the people welcomed him because they had all been waiting for him. Thank you. Uh, Noel? Then a man named Jairus arrived. He was an official in the local synagogue. He threw himself down at Jesus' feet and begged him to go to his home. Wait. Thank you. Nigel? Because his only daughter who was 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went along, the people were crowding him from every side. Thank you. More the guy. Among them was a woman who had suffered from severe bleeding for 12 years. She had spent all she had on doctors, but no one had been able to cure her. Uh, Eugene. She came up in the crowd behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak and her bleeding stopped at once. Thanks, Christina. Jesus asked, who touched me? Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, the people are all around you and crowding in on you. Thank you. Anna. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I knew it when power went out of me. Okay, I'm going to read the last two. Huh? The woman saw that she had been found out, so she came trembling and threw herself at Jesus' feet. There, in front of everybody, she told him why she had touched him and how she had been healed at once. Jesus said to her, My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, this is an amazing miracle. Okay, if you think about it, huh? this miracle happened huh? just by a woman touching the edge of Jesus' cloak. Okay, and we always find uh, that when, when I always find uh, that when I read this story, uh, and I've seen a lot of people recreate this uh, story in you know in movies in this one, uh, and sometimes we 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 think uh, that it's like this. You know. I hope you can see this. Uh. Okay, sometimes we think that it's like this. You know that oh okay, this is the edge of the cloak. The hujong the upon your cloak uh. Okay, and the woman just managed to touch you know the edge of the cloak. Okay, but actually, uh, in actual fact, okay, Jesus' cloak uh, would look something like this. Okay, because Jesus was already, you know, he had that reputation as a rabbi, uh, as a teacher. Okay, so he probably, uh, he probably would be wearing a cloak like this, with this, you know, with these freely, freely edges uh, that we call tassels. Okay, uh, something like this. So this is what we call a tassel. Uh. 
Okay, so this is a more, I would say, a more accurate depiction uh, of what it would have meant uh, when you know the woman was touching the edge of the cloak. Okay, because this picture tells us uh, that any part of the cloak will do. You know? Okay, this is a pretty easy thing to be able to touch. Uh. Okay, but this is not that easy. You know? The edge of the cloak uh, is just, you know, one of these very few tassels. Uh. Okay, if you look at this tassel, there's not that many tassels. And there's only, in this one, there's only one, two, three, four. That is, that is reachable and touchable. Uh. You know, if you miss it, uh, you miss it. You know? That's it. You know? Okay, so, you know, for this woman uh, to be able to do that now and to believe uh, that if she could just touch the edge of the cloak, uh, then she would be healed. Uh, okay, it's probably what drew Jesus uh, to make this famous statement. My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Okay, this sentence, and as I've mentioned before, this sentence has also been said one time, you know, previously. Okay, go back and check. Okay, which chapter and which event uh, where Jesus said, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Okay, because uh, in Jairus' case, uh, it was not, uh, sorry, Jairus and then the Roman centurion servant uh, is, you know, uh, talking about having faith. Okay, but this one is, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Almost the exact same words as the one on the previous uh, event. Okay, go back and check which event uh, has this one. Okay, but the one thing that we need to appreciate lah, okay, is that for this woman lah, to be able to touch the edge of Jesus' cloak and to have that much conviction lah, okay, really would be the reason why Jesus would say this, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Okay, go in peace. Okay, I'm going to go back to the slide. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so okay, so we find that a few things about this woman that we need to re realize uh, that she has been suffering this bleeding condition now uh, for twelve years. Okay, uh, what this bleeding condition actually is, we are not really very really sure. But I think the blue book down there and the note there are some things that they say uh, Okay, but all we know is that she has been suffering this bleeding for twelve years. And, you know, no one was able to heal her. She had spent all the money that she had on doctors. No one had been able to cure her. And because she was always perpetually bleeding, okay, then to the Jews, now she would be constantly unclean. Okay, because she would all have all these, you know, bodily fluids now coming out of her. Okay, and because of that, nobody wanted to be associated with her. Remember, the Jews uh, regard, regarded cleanliness, uh, Really, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness when it comes to the Jews. Okay, so you know, you must be clean in the eyes of God. If you have all these bodily fluids coming out, if you're bleeding, okay, then you'll always be unclean and nobody will want to talk to you, nobody will want to even, you know, socialize with you. So she was an outcast. You know, she would have to live in fear, she would have to hide, okay, always in order for her to be able to move around. Okay, but yet uh, again we find in the same way that the woman with the alabaster jar had uh, she had the courage, she came up in the crowd. Okay, remember Peter tells us uh, that people are crowding all around Jesus. Okay, it's not uh, like Jesus is in front and everybody just follows at the back, uh, like so good like that. You know, it's not that nice. Everybody is around Jesus, everybody is trying to get a piece of the action. And here is this woman who was bleeding for 12 years, trying very hard not to touch anybody else. <laughs> okay, macam corona saja. Okay, so that she doesn't make other people unclean. Okay, so she came up in the crowd behind Jesus and she touched the edge of his cloak. And in doing so, her bleeding stopped at once. Jesus didn't even do any, I mean, sorry. Jesus didn't, you know, didn't even need to say anything. Okay, all the woman did was just to touch the edge of his cloak, one of the tassels, okay, and then the bleeding stopped all at once. Okay, and Jesus realized this, you know, and asked who touched him. You know, in the crowd, uh, in the midst of the crowd, everybody was around him. Uh, Jesus asked, who touched me? Okay, everyone said, no, uh, nobody touched you. Uh. Everyone denied. And Peter also said, it's impossible to tell because there's so many people around you. How are you going to know who touched you? Okay, and Jesus, you know, Jesus insisted that uh, he knew somebody had touched him because power went out of him. 
Okay. Yeah, I've heard people preach on this before and say, oh, Jesus is like battery. Uh. So if they, somebody touch and then some power will come out of him, you know, like the power draining out of the battery. But the thing is this, uh, okay? I think Jesus wanted, wanted, uh, Jesus wanted to make this woman known. Not to shame her. Okay? Not to shame her. I, and some people, some people have asked me, you know, huh? if Jesus is God and he knows everything, right? surely he would know. No, surely he would know who touched him, you know. So, I wouldn't, I would definitely not say that Jesus didn't know who touched him, but I would say that the reason why Jesus asked who touched him uh, is to give an opportunity to the woman uh, to present herself, to come out and to testify. Okay, it would be, it would have been, it would have been very different uh, if Jesus was to say, Hoy, you touched me, right? <laughs> Okay, it would have been very different. It would have, it, there's a totally different feel altogether. You know, if Jesus would have said, who touched me? As opposed to, you are the one that touched me, right? Okay, the, you know, the first is a question. And, you know, you, the person who was healed, uh, the woman who was healed, could have just kept quiet. Okay? The, could have just kept quiet. But now, uh, if Jesus would say, ah, you are the one that touched me, right? Then the person now uh, has no choice, you know. No choice at all, but, you know, have to testify. Okay? But the woman, uh, we find that because Jesus asked, who touched me? The woman saw no way out because Jesus wanted to know, okay, uh, who this person was. Uh, Jesus wanted everybody to know, okay, who this person was. Okay? So she came and she trembled and threw herself at Jesus. We, we find that this seems to be a pattern. Uh, okay? Everybody, whenever they want to see Jesus, uh, they always throw themselves at Jesus' feet. So the guy in Garasa also, also like that. This woman with the bleeding also, also like that. Okay, and we find that a lot of people also were throwing themselves at Jesus' feet. Lah. Okay, and this is the important thing. This is the reason why I think Jesus purposefully asked this question. Who touched me? I want to know who touched me. In front of everyone, this woman told Jesus why she had touched him. And she testified that, that because she had touched him, okay, she was healed at once. And I think that this was probably the reason why Jesus wanted everybody to listen to this woman's testimony so that he could say to her, my daughter, okay, number one. Okay, number two, he also wanted to say, your faith has made you well. Okay, and number three, to go in peace. In this one sentence, uh, Okay, in this one sentence, Jesus, um, I want to say ends, okay, but actually I know that after this, there's the story of Jairus. Lah. But it's interesting uh, that in chapter 8, uh, Luke begins chapter 8 uh, by telling us about the women that were with Jesus. Okay, the women that were with Jesus, and, and I mentioned last week uh, that the women that were with Jesus, uh, Luke specifically mentions them because in those days, women were looked you know, women were like, no, no high standing. La. Okay, only the men only got high standing. But Luke begins the chapter by talking about the women that were with Jesus. And towards the end of the chapter, we find out that there are two instances. La. Okay, there were two instances la, and there were two women involved. Of course, number one is Jairus' daughter, which we're not going to focus on. But the one that we should be focusing on now is this woman who was bleeding for 12 years for Jesus to say for Jesus to tell her my daughter okay is an affirmation for her you know it is it, an it's a form of affirmation for her that you know she is also loved uh, you know that the son of god uh, also loves her okay so he calls her my daughter it is a it is a form of affection uh, uh, that shows you know some level of importance okay and then of course after that jesus says you know your faith has made you well okay go in peace it is because of her faith okay that jesus asked the question who touched me i want to know who touched me because some power has gone out of me it's not because jesus doesn't know okay but it's because jesus wants to display that faith Okay, display that faith that has made her well. Okay. And 
I'm going to draw this uh, to the story of Jairus. If you remember, uh, uh, when we were talking about Jairus, we were contrasting between Jairus and the people around Jairus' daughter okay, and the Roman centurion. Okay? And there was this comparison of faith. Okay, and I've I've seen people I've seen people who teach this section uh, who also does this same comparison uh, with this woman, okay, who was a social outcast, uh, but she had this tremendous amount of faith, and she only needed to believe uh, that I just touched the cloak uh, enough, okay. As opposed to Jairus, uh, Jairus was a respected member of the community, somebody uh, every somebody who everybody looks up to, okay, but he had so little faith. You know, until Jesus had to say, uh, don't be afraid, just have faith, just believe. Okay? Jesus had to assure Jairus, you know, a person who was supposed to be of high standing. Whereas this woman who was a social outcast uh, needed no form of, you know, uh, didn't even need to be assured. She just believed. You know, that's that tremendous amount of faith. Uh. You know, when we do all these compar- when we do all these faith, faith comparisons, uh, we find that this theme uh, seems to recur, you know, a lot. People that we don't always look at, people that you know, the people that society always you know push aside, uh, all these people seems to have more faith in Jesus than the people who are you know of good standing and the people who are respected in the community. You know, all these people seems to be very floundering in their faith. It's in, I mean, it's yeah, it's interesting. To I find this chapter very interesting because Luke starts off with the woman and ends with the woman, and then of course there's this comparison of faith as well. Okay, and Jesus ended by saying, "You know, go in peace." The same thing that he said in the previous event where he said this sentence. Okay, go and find out which sentence this, uh, which event is this. This is the second time that Jesus says, "Your faith has made you well. Go in peace." Okay, you must know what is the first event because too many questions have come up again, time and time again uh, on the comparison between these two events Okay, that ended up with this one. Okay, so I'm going to end uh, by just uh, giving you a bit of this one. So explain how the Jewish laws had been violated by the woman's touch on Jesus. Okay, number one, the woman was considered unclean. Okay, because she had a lot of blood discharge, she was bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. So because she was unclean, she was forbidden to mingle with people in the public. Okay, and you know, like if she were to touch them, uh, then she would make them unclean. So anything that she touched would be you know, will be rendered unclean. Even Jesus' cloak. Okay, because she touched Jesus' cloak, uh, actually she could have been severely kind of marah. Lah. Okay, like because she made Jesus unclean. Okay, she was actually defiling him and making him unclean as well. Okay, so it is important for us to appreciate this because when we see what the woman did, lah, okay, in order to go and touch Jesus, how much difficulty she had to endure because of her faith, okay, it should inspire us. Okay, it should inspire us to, you know, to continue to live uh, for Christ. Okay, as people who believe in Jesus, okay, as people uh, who who hold on dear uh, to God's word, okay, let us not forget, Okay, how, you know, how sometimes uh, people have to. <laughs> sorry, uh, <clears throat> how sometimes people have to. Uh, you know, endure certain things uh, for the things that they believe in. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little bit, sorry, I'm running a little bit out of context. Lah. Okay, but I just, it just, it just brought back to mind when I was uh, going through this. Lah. Now, actually, another lesson that can be drawn lah, from this is sometimes, you know, in order for us to stand up to our faith, lah, we, sorry, sorry, in the past, in the past, many heroes of our Christian faith have had to endure a lot of things, you know, because they were standing up for what they believed in. Okay, but Jesus assures us, Okay, Jesus assures us that you know He is always with us. Uh, he's always with us. He has never forgotten us, and uh, just like you know the woman, uh, the woman that was uh, that was touching Jesus's cloak, uh, you know, it's not that Jesus didn't know who touched him, uh, who touched his cloak, okay. But it is more that Jesus wanted people to know, okay. 
um, in order for her to become a testimony. Okay, so likewise, if there's something that God has done for you, you know, and uh, and that you are you know thankful for, okay, don't be afraid to testify. Okay, be like the woman. Uh, okay, la, I'm not gonna say be like the woman. Yes, the woman actually was first afraid, lah. Okay, but don't be afraid to testify. You know, whenever God does something good for you, whenever the, whenever God uh, does a miracle in your life, okay, something that you believe uh, could never happen but actually happened and it was a good thing, you know, something that changed your life, okay, don't be afraid to testify for Christ. Okay, because that's how we glorify God, you know, by sharing uh, to others, uh, okay, about what God has done for us. Okay. And that's the end of chapter eight. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to end this. Uh, we will pray. Any questions from anybody? Uh, um, can I ask one? Can can. Is it is it common that back then to greet a woman, we would use my daughter. Or is it something that Jesus personally personally um, says? Mm. This is something that is found in the blue book, I think. I think the blue book tells us something about this. This is my daughter thing. But I don't have it. I don't have the blue book with me now. So let me see if I can find it. Does anybody have the blue book? I remember reading this in the blue book. This is my daughter thing. Oh, there we are. My daughter. Jesus addressed her tenderly as daughter. In all the gospels, she's the only woman he addressed in this way. I guess... Um, I guess that um, because in the blue book, uh, the footnote tells us that in all the Gospels, this is the only woman that uh, Jesus addresses this way. So my guess is that it is probably something that is not very common because if it's very common, then Jesus will call everybody my daughter. Um, yeah, but since it is, this is the only record that we have of Jesus calling a, a particular woman my daughter, uh, we can probably make an educated guess la, that uh, this is something that is not very commonly practiced. La. Like, you know, you don't go to every woman and say, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. <laughs> I, does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, if there's no questions, uh, thanks for coming for today's class. I'm going to stop the recording now. Oh.